fire safety guidelines and processes, and addressing your water infiltra infiltration problems. As Albert said, a fire and water theme to tonight's membership meeting of the Co-op and Condo Council. Our first speaker is no stranger to the CCAC and BRI membership. He is Stuart Mathile. He is the principal of Fleet West Management Corporation. He is a former senior management rep with the American Red Cross, the Westchester County chapter of the American Red Cross. He will be our first speaker this evening on fire safety guidelines and processes. Please welcome Stuart Mathile. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you, Albert. I'm pleased to be here with you tonight. Um, I'm a former Director of Emergency Services for the Red Cross, and I'll be speaking in, in general terms. You have in front of you uh, a handout. I wish you would please take that up, because I'll be following the handout uh, in terms of the items. I'm not going to be speaking on behalf of the fire departments tonight uh, in the county, uh, speaking as a uh, person who deals with consequence management. Since we have such a short amount of time and such a long list, I'm going to just go right into an emergency response plan, fire response component. All building owners, co-op, condo, homeowners association should have an emergency response plan for disasters and it should have a fire component. It's an all-hazards approach. If you're good and prepared for one item, you're prepared for everything, usually. So if you don't have a plan, a comprehensive all-hazards plan, and I've been talking about this for many, many years, as I'm sure many of you who have heard me before speak, it's most important that you have a disaster plan. And tonight we'll talk about the fire response component. The most important aspect of this planning process is tenant education and staff education. All of the information out there on the internet, things that you might see on television, fire is the most prevalent disaster in the United States, by far. You may hear about floods, you may hear about airplane crashes, about snowstorms, all kinds of things. The individual family fire is still the most prevalent disaster. Thousands and thousands of people are put out of their homes, property destruction, lives are lost. So regardless of whether there's a legal imperative to follow the local guidelines and preparedness tenets, there's a moral obligation on owners and boards to take up the cause of educating their residents and their staff. And I have included on your tables, there's a sample of the New York State Office of Fire Prevention flyer. There are many, many flyers and pamphlets available from the state of New York, also from the city of New York, um, fire department, which you can import. They're universally uh, available. And it's important that these get out to residents on a regular basis, not just once or twice. But quarterly, people forget, people don't take to heart disaster or fire preparedness. I want to talk about evacuations and route identification. By a show of hands, has anybody ever had to have their building evacuated because of a major fire? Anybody in the room at this point? You're very lucky. I've had, had a couple of them. Um, Again, it goes to tenant education, resident education. People have to know what to do. They have to do the what ifs. They have to think about what it would be like to be woken up in the middle of the night by sirens and people pounding on their doors, what to take, what to do, what not to do. Do they have escape ladders? Two-story buildings, possibly. Most do not, I would venture to say. How many people here have developments that have escape ladders that have two-story escape ladders out. They're available. How, if you can't get out your front door and you can't get through your fire stairs, where would you go? Out your window. Do you want to jump? You may not have time to wait for the fire department, although the, the response time in Westchester County is excellent. Minutes. But sometimes minutes 
You don't have minutes, you have seconds. So that's something to consider. I don't remember whether it's required in New York, or rather in Westchester County yet, because I have been focusing my management and activities in, in the city for the last five or six years. Having your apartment designations at the floor level, down below, I'm pretty sure it was passed in Westchester County, but even if it has not yet passed, bringing down the apartment identifications from up above on the door down to the ground, to the, to the floor level, is essential. Because when a building fills up with smoke, where do you go? To the floor, right? That's what you've all been taught. If you smell smoke, you crawl out. Similarly, the fire department, when they come into a building, will crawl along. They will not know that there's a, a number up on top, three or four feet or five feet off the ground. They have to be on the door at the bottom, in reflective, large, I think they're New York, they, they pass the law, it's three inches. So whether it's required or not, you need to do it. It's necessary for a fire department to be able to search a building effectively and this originated, I think, in California. I think they were the first to do it nationally. It's starting to spread as a life safety component all around the country. So that's something that's important to remind yourselves of. Root identification. Reflective applications in stairwells, along corridors. So people, if there are no emergency lighting in the, in the building, you're lucky enough to have it. It only lasts maybe half an hour from the time it's activated by a smoke or fire detection. You need to be able to get people to safe routes out. And many times, just as you might find in planes, those, those um, colored lights that direct you to exits, these are reflective uh, applications that can be placed in stairwells that will, will uh, glow in the dark and will guide people out safely. Something to consider for installation. Not very expensive, but there is an expense. But given the life safety benefits, there's no question that it should be installed. Human needs. Um, the Red Cross and other volunteer organizations act in the disaster respond to fires. In Westchester County is primarily the American Red Cross. And Buildings, as a part of their, their plan, need to understand where people would evacuate to and should work with local disaster planners in their local communities, the fire chiefs uh, or the local town or city governments, need to understand where would the nearest evacuation center be in case there were a fire in your building. If you have a large complex, uh, high rise especially important. Uh, many people evacuate will go to friends' houses, they'll go to uh, family, uh, but you need to be able to have a uh, reception center area set up. If you have a large enough complex, you might be using a community room as an initial place if it's not affected by the fire. But you definitely need to have an understanding of what the emergency response plan is for your building in the community. And again, find that out from the local fire department, uh, the Office of Emergency Management in the county can be helpful in that respect as well. Permits and licenses. I don't have to remind you that there are permits and licenses required for many aspects of fire, uh, fire prevention. Uh, depending on your jurisdiction, you need to make sure they're up to date. Any licenses that superintendents might be required to have. There aren't many in Westchester. There's far more in the city of New York. But nonetheless, there are, there are uh, oil tank storage for those of you still using oil, uh, all types of permits, make sure they're up to date. Penalties for not having them up to date or, or not renewing them are quite severe, so it's important that you pay attention to those. A chief's book, Incident Command. If you should be unfortunate enough to have a fire in your building, whether it be small or large, it's important for the first arriving officers to have uh, a, a binder that has information about the complex. 
Fire departments do regularly do inspections of properties to familiarize themselves with how they would respond in case of a, a, a disaster or a fire, but they don't always have all the necessary information up to date. So ideally, if you have a, a fire, there should be a, a binder that has the, uh, uh, the most readily available resident list, uh, uh, plans for the building, any items that are stored that might be hazardous, locations, and other such information. Very important to a fire chief coming on the scene to be handed this, and he can then take that to his command post and work with either board members who might be available, uh, or a building manager that's able to get to the scene quickly, uh, be able to help with, be able to, to know what features the building has uh, that they can use in order to make their attack on the fire or emergency more effective. Resident notification communications. After, after a fire, let's say you have an evacuation or a tire building loss, which has happened in Westchester on a number of occasions. You have to be able to get in touch with your residents. They may be scattered all over the place. If you're lucky, you'll have a, uh, a website. But if you want to be able to reach people, they have a system such uh, used in, in the town of North Castle, as an example. Uh, the Nixle system, you get a, a message on your phone, giving information about what's going on, updates on uh, the cleanup activities, what, what apartments are affected, what people can return to their units, what people may have to stay away until rehabilitation is effective. So these are, uh, there are many different types of systems like this available, and uh, this is just one example of one. Alteration agreements, I want to speak briefly. Uh, make sure your alteration agreements uh, take into consideration fire hazards, electrical wiring. It's important that they, they reflect the current codes. People many times will do alterations in their apartments and maybe not do the right type of alteration, may not use a licensed electrician. It's important that these alteration agreements uh, and condos and co-ops are, are kept up to date. Quarters and seniors. Uh, I've managed developments that have quarters and, and of course seniors. As the population gets older, you're going to see more and more problems with seniors, food on the stove, um, all kinds of trouble that seniors can get into. It's important that organizations take the time to reach out to the seniors, monitor their activities, monitor their activities to the extent that's reasonable, but be aware that, that there's a higher risk in an aging population. Uh, in terms of hoarders, you may or may not have those problems, but I dare say in larger developments, there's always one or two people. These can be tremendous fire hazards. It's important that you identify them and make sure that, that the places get cleaned up and fire hazards are eliminated. Central station alarms. You all probably have smoke alarms as per code in all of your buildings and various places. Problem with, with having smoke alarms, even if they're hardwired, is that could be a holiday weekend, could be a wing of your development in a building or a homeowners association or a co-op, where everybody goes away. Maybe nobody in that wing or on those floors. Fire starts, the alarm goes off, nobody hears it. Gets going and going and going, before you know it, it, it can't be put out easily. So I advocate making sure, if possible, that it's an economic issue, having Central station alarms, having a pad in each apartment, you add it into the cost of your operating, your monthly operating costs. The advantage of having them is that people can get and pay for extra for uh, their uh, uh, burglar alarms and, and child monitoring and cameras and all kinds of bells and whistles. But what you'll get is when there's a fire, the fire department gets notified instantly and they make it speeds the response up. Again, it's an economic consideration, but as a life safety issue, it's, it, it goes miles to dealing with the problem of people not hearing smoke alarms. Of course, I don't have to remind you, educating residents to make sure that they, they change their batteries, which we do every year, we have public service announcements and so on, still have to maintain uh, that 
that issue. Residential fire drills, nobody does them. I think I'm the only person in Westchester history to ever have conducted a, a, a residential fire alarm in a, in a, in a condo in, in Arsley. Um, I was lucky that one of the board members' brothers was in the fire department there and we put together an actual evacuation. We set it up on a Saturday. People evacuated, the fire department went in, the Red Cross responded. It's, re it's required in New York City, and the commercial buildings are required to have fire drills, right? There is no requirement for residential fire drills. Why not? Are commercial buildings more important than residential buildings? I say, if it can be done, and it's a bit of an undertaking, you have a residential fire drill once every X number of years. In larger properties, it's difficult, but not impossible. This was, I think, a 60 or 70 unit uh, uh, condominium. And you can work with the, the county. Uh, I dare say would give you some assistance in helping coordinate this, but it's, it's something that's it's way overdue, and it should be something that, that owners and co-ops and condos consider. <coughs> community emergency response team training. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the community emergency response teams. There are about nine of them in the county. You can, in larger developments, or even in smaller ones, buildings, you can have a certain number of people trained. It takes about six weeks. They're trained in all aspects of disaster response. And it's necessary to have these kinds of people in your developments and buildings so that they can assist when the emergency happens. Sooner or later, something's going to happen. So I'm saying that this is important. Fire extinguishers for residents, not required, but essential. And how to use them. It's something that should be a part of every building owner and manager and, and co-op or condominium program. Emergency lighting, I said earlier, only good for 30 minutes. You may consider longer need, longer term need for emergency lighting, in case you have to light an area um, that's not covered by your existing emergency lighting. One final item, hoverboards. Does everybody know what a hoverboard is? Those little motorized that, that are given to self destruction and, and blowing up, you may have seen them several years ago. Had one in a building out in Queens. Came in, kids brought it in, exploded, completely destroyed the apartment. Could have been prevented if the people had a fire extinguisher. So like they all ran out, everybody got out perfect, very, very, very quickly, but they lost the entire uh, two-story uh, 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 co-op unit. So for lack of a simple fire extinguisher, you pull the pin and put it out, you had a couple, maybe $100,000, $150,000 worth of damage. So that being said, I, again, this is a short list. Go on the internet. I urge you to take to heart these items and do what's necessary to protect your, your populations and your buildings. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Stuart. I can say in my 30 years with the Building and Realty Institute, Stuart Mathile is always there for the BRI and its component associations. He has written for an impact on monthly newspaper. He has spoken at our meetings and seminars. He's come on our radio programs. He is a true ally of the BRI. So Stuart, once again, thank you for your participation. Speaking of true allies of the BRI, our next speaker is Jason Schiciano. He is co-president of Levitt First Associates, which is the insurance manager of the CCAC, as well as the Building and Realty Institute. Jason is here with his colleague, Pat Clare, the director of real estate for Levitt First. Please welcome Jason Schiciano, who, by the way, has done just as Stuart Mathile has done, has written for Impact, our newspaper, has appeared in our radio programs, and has spoken numerous times at our meetings and seminars. Please welcome Jason Skishan. Uh, thank you for having me this evening. I, I guess I'm going to be kind of a transitional speaker uh, talking about both uh, fire and water, uh, because fire and water are probably the two uh, most uh, impactful perils when it comes to insurance, as many of you unfortunately uh, are aware. 
uh, water uh, claims certainly are the most prevalent type of claim for insurance, whether it be water through the roof or water through, uh, through <coughs> holes in the bricks or water from the underground or water from a pipe break. Um, and then, of course, fire can be just uh, tremendously devastating and uh, both types of uh, perils have insurance implications. So um, <clears throat> the good thing, as Jeff mentioned about having written so many articles and impact, is that whenever there's a topic that I'm asked to speak about, I literally can just go back to like 50 articles of impact and come up with some article that was written somewhere along the way. So you have a few of them uh, three, uh, on your table, and I'm just going to refer to a few uh, highlights of those articles, which you can uh, read at, at your leisure if you have very, very, very good eyes. Uh, if not, I encourage you to go on to the BRI website where you can look at elect electronic copies of uh, the historical uh, impact uh, newsletters, and you will be able to read this probably much easier. Uh, than from this document. Um, the first one, the first article was uh, how can a recommendation be a requirement and what will eventually happen if I, do, if I do not comply. So this article dealt with the fact that many of you that are on uh, uh, co-op boards or our property managers know that your insurance company, your, your package insurance carrier will come out and do an inspection of your property. Uh, certainly when you find coverage with a new carrier within uh, 30 days usually that will happen and then periodically uh, thereafter every couple or three years uh, thereafter and when the insurance company comes out and does that inspection they normally compile a list of what they call recommendations but as the title of this article suggests recommendations and in insurance lingo are really requirements in that if you choose not to do them in most <coughs> cases your carrier will non-renew you eventually consider you to be uncooperative and putting their millions of dollars at risk, not to mention your own uh, financial exposure, by not doing things that you know can easily be done, granted some cost money, uh, in order to prevent loss. So some of these things relate to fire and water. Uh, for instance, fire. Many of you um, live in garden style uh, apartments or condos. Uh, others of you have um, uh, balconies off your buildings, and you may or may not have uh, allowed barbecue grills or even charcoal grills. So I can just tell you right off the bat, if you have charcoal grills, you probably will get at some point, if you haven't already, a recommendation or requirement by your insurance company to ban charcoal grills. They are just a, um, a, a terror when it comes to potential fire. People, um, they think the coals are out, they dump the kettle you know, into the flower bed, uh, then the wind kicks up and the embers kick up and it blows onto the building and it starts a fire, or something along those lines. So you know, barbecue grills, that's one recommendation you might see. Repairing roofs, repairing roof shingles, prevent water from coming in. I mean, we have so much rain and huge storms these days that if you've got uh, you know, uh, potential penetration points for water to come in at your roofs and you're not doing something about that, um, that's an obvious concern that insurance companies get to have and that you should have. Um, the more of these claims that you have drives up your insurance rates, eventually your insurance company cancels you and then you're going to be paying more for less. Um, brick pointing, similar to roofing, it's, it's got to be done. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. And then, you know, something as simple as trash and debris in the, in the hallways. Um, there were some excellent points that Stuart made about fire prevention. Well, if you do have a fire and you need to get out, you need to have a clear pathway. And you don't want to start having to move trash bags and bicycles from your exit path when there's a fire going on in your building. Um, so those are a couple of the uh, recommendations that are really requirements that you might commonly see from an insurance carrier. The other, the next article dealt with uh, 10 insurance facts regarding flood insurance. So you can read this again at your leisure. The, the things to know are, number one, every building, every property, every parcel is in a flood zone. Every single one. Some, however, are considered high-risk flood zones. The high-risk flood zones are, flood, are, are properties that, number one, you typically cannot get flood insurance for on your typical package insurance policy. You have to buy a separate policy, usually through the National Flood Insurance Program. 
There are different restrictions and requirements uh, and conditions if you've got an apartment building or co-op versus if you have a condominium uh, in terms of how much flood insurance you can have or even can get. But you need to know whether or not you're in a high-risk flood zone. <clears throat> and if you are, you definitely should have flood insurance. If you have a loan on your building, your lender may be requiring you to have flood insurance. If you have units being bought and sold and there are mortgages on those units, those lenders are going to require that the building be properly insured for flood, which only the association can do. Now here's the thing. If you're not in a high-risk flood zone, you may still need to get flood insurance. Just because the government hasn't uh, you know, put a tag on your property that says high-risk flood zone doesn't mean that you can't have a flood. And just because you're not in the area of a body of water or a stream doesn't mean you can't have a flood. A flood is a rapid accumulation of surface water on a normally dry area. It can be groundwater. So it doesn't have to be an overflow of a body of water from its banks. The other important thing to know about flooding is that fully 30% of flood, floods happen in non-high-risk zones. So, and if you haven't had a flood and you say, well, I've been, this building's property's been here for 50 years, I've never had a flood, you know, there's a lot of people that have said that along the way in the last decade or so that have been uh, uh, affected by weather events that have caused things to happen that have never happened before. So think about flood insurance. Um, lastly, there's an article that I wrote after um, uh, the hurricanes came through a couple years ago. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I wanted to point out here was that, um, first of all, water that comes in through a hole that shouldn't be there is probably not going to be covered by your insurance policy. So if you have a hole in your roof that you knew about, it's clearly been there for a while, it didn't happen when the wind blew the shingles off or blew part of the roof off. It was there, there was evidence of seepage, you know, and for months and months and months where people were complaining, and then you had a big storm come through and you had water damage, that's probably not going to be covered. Same thing with brick pointing. If you ignore brick pointing and you have what's called wind-driven rain, water is driven you know, into the side of a building and leaks through, through the side of a building, that, that's probably not going to be covered either. And when you couple that with the fact that oftentimes water, uh, certain types of water claims have higher deductibles, these are claims that happen frequently and that you really need to avoid because they're going to cost you a lot of money out of pocket, they potentially will increase your insurance rates, and in the end of the day, you're probably better, it's more cost effective just to do the proper require maintenance, follow the insurance company recommendations, and, and put your building in much better uh, condition. Okay, any questions on any, any of this stuff? Yes, sir. Well, it, we might, we want to just hold off on questions until oh, we have fine. a presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much. Talk to you later. <laughs> thank you, Jason. As always, an A-plus effort by Jason Skishano. Many thanks. Water infiltration is something that buildings and complexes, as you all know, have to deal with on an almost regular basis. We are very fortunate this evening to have with us Tom Plannert, a new member of the Building and Realty Institute, who, who will review what needs to be done when water infiltration problems arise. Tom is the principal of substrate testing, correct Tom? Substrate, substrate testing, and you're based in? I'm uh, Cape Cod. Uh, the company's actually a New Jersey company. Okay, a New Jersey-based company that recently joined the Building and Realty Institute. We were very, very happy to, Tom, to have Tom join our association. So please welcome to both the Building and Realty Institute and to our panel of speakers for tonight's membership meeting of the CCAC, Tom Planner. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, basically give you my background first. Um, I got in the field of uh, chemical routing about 35 years ago. Um, I wrote the specifications for the subway system. Uh, and started sealing their tunnels and all their things 35 years ago. So I've been under your buildings for a long time, uh, sealing all the water lines with tremendous uh, hydraulic force against those cracks and leaks. And I ran a company with eight crews, um, and we did uh, 
name a famous place in New York, the Empire State Building, the George Washington Bridge, and you sealed uh, almost all the subway stations and uh, tunnels in the subway system as well. So we've been all over New York for a long time. And I'm trying to introduce my services and the chemical products world to building owners. And it's new for most people. Most engineers and architects have heard of it. They just don't know much about it. They know that it works. And it's not popular. Um, what I'd like to start with, I, I always try to do this, is I send out two samples. The breakthrough, what happened and what made chemical grouting effective, is that uh, in the gold mines in Germany, they were literally five miles deep, and they ran into a huge water fissure. And some brilliant engineer, way smarter than I'll ever be, figured out that there's some kind of a chemical that reacts with the molecules in water, and it was a urethane-based product, but it remained flexible. And being that they were mining gold, they said, let's, let's look after who's. They tried everything else, they couldn't stop the water. So they injected this urethane material and it sealed up the fissure. 3M, the big monster in this country, got a hold of that information and brought it over here. <coughs> so this is an example of the product. You can move these two little plates. You can see that you move them just slightly sheer, but that's tremendously important. In the, in the 50s, for example, the only options were hydraulic cement or epoxy. People would fix a crack, and six months later, Mother Nature would move that crack for a variety of reasons, temperature changes, vibration, etc., and be back to square one. So if you'd be so kind as to pass these around, because I like people to try to, you know, to, to get to see what that material is like with that. Material has been used in the subways and has been bonded and has been done on, on numerous jobs over the years, that's what they use to this day. Um, that's just one of the, there's about 200 chemical grouts out there now, but that's one of the ones that's used. Um, the other note that's important uh, before I start, um, I was a contractor, but I'm also a consultant. Um, I was going at a crazy pace, running eight crews, and my wife, uh, I live on Cape Cod, she said, slow down a little bit, so I'm just doing the consulting now. Um, but I work with all kinds of building owners uh, that have water related problems. And most all, as you know, property managers and owners run into a water leak or a crack in concrete eventually will break. Um, so I'm not expecting people to uh, uh, pay attention to this right now as suddenly having a problem. A few of you will. But in general, nine months from now, almost all of you will run into that kind of a headache. So I'd like to be a resource for you. With that said, I will go through the slideshow fairly quickly. I'm not going to get into a lot of technical. I'm a civil engineer or PE. So I can get into the technical with a bunch of engineers, but you're mostly property managers, and, and, and so I'm going to try to go very quickly through this information. The reason I'm even doing this is I want you to understand that it's not simple. You have to understand the substrate first. When they first came out with chemical grouting, first million dollar job in the subway, 23 guys jumped right into it. They went down to Texas, where the manufacturers were, and over the weekend, between cocktails, came out experts in chemical grouting, just ask them. So I would go to the major contractors, the Tullys, the, the Perinis. They're at half by price, what are we doing here? And they said, we have the bonding companies, we'll clean it, they'll call you up to clean up the mess, and that's exactly what happened. About two years later, the phone started ringing off the hook, and they were all gone. I was the only guy left. The reason I was left is because I approached it like an engineer and analyzed the substrate first and figure out why. So let me go through that quickly. So infrastructure, historical preservation, all kinds of unusual applications with chemical drugs. Uh, sewer and water systems, uh, highways, uh, buildings, of course, tunnels, all kinds of tunnels, uh, cracks in concrete. Uh, anywhere near the water, locks, canals, wharfs, water washes out uh, and creates cracks and water problems. Um, concrete dams. Um, Seawalls, uh, sinkholes, uh, so water is a, a major <laughs> problem for, for many people. Um, there are different types of grouts. Uh, hydrophilic versus hydrophobic. Hydrophilic it generally means you're pumping one to one with water. Very simple. Hydrophobic is 3% water. It still needs water, just much less water. Those materials were made to pump outside the structure. If there's a stream going by, it would push the water away instead of being diluted. So that's why they came up with those materials. There's A and B type of urethanes. Uh, there's two sides to chemical grouting. One is stopping water. I'm a remedial waterproofer. I'm not a waterproofer. I'm a remedial waterproofer with chemical grouting. The other side to chemical grouting is lifting slabs. If you have a floor slab that's settled, uh, that can be lifted now with chemical grouts back to level. 
Uh, some of the materials used worldwide, the acrylides and acrylamides, those are from Germany. Uh, they're used in the school system now. Uh, they're finally able to school, but to seal the, the gigantic brick foundations, the city block size foundation. For the first time, they're able to get those floors dry. So the kids going to school don't have to deal with Legionnaires' disease and mosquitoes and all the fun that goes with stagnant pools. Um, sodium silicates are used worldwide. Cellular concrete, if you have a void the size of this room, and I've had that happen, it's a very lightweight material that can fill up that void and then inject the expensive material. Uh, bentonite clay is from Wyoming. Bentonite's been used for a long time uh, to encapsulate the very inexpensive. They all have their pluses and minuses. Uh, considerations with the material. The most common reason for failure of a project is the selection of the wrong material. I've seen so many projects where some guy came down and he pumped a material that's very good at stabilizing soil. It has no business being in a moving crack. It's a rigid material. So people have to know, and that's a big part of it, is finding out which material they use. Uh, with the material selection, is what is the intent? Is it a water leak? Are you filling a void on the other side of a wall? Um, do you have running sand? Uh, there's a number of different things, gushing leaks. You can, you can now see leaks that are coming out of a crack or a hole, uh, like a hydrant. And without even touching the leak, you can inject it and stop that thing. There's grouse that kick off in five seconds and turn into a hockey puck. So you can stop almost any leak nowadays with that. Uh, some of the different things that I look at, uh, the reason I analyze the substrate, um, is it compatible with the existing materials? Let's say, for example, your waterproofing is a bentonite system. Bentonite is a bond breaker. So you can pump chemical grouts all day long, you're not going to get a seal. You won't get any adhesion to the substrate. So I need to know what's the existing waterproofing. It's just a fast example. Um, the tensile strength, uh, you can be 300 feet uh, down on the ground and seal off water leaks with weak materials like jello, like sodium silicates, because it's PSI everyone thinks of. You're down to a ten thousandth of an inch. There's no area for the force to push against. So I won't get into the technical. I'll try to go faster. But uh, these are the different different kinds of things I go through. Uh, pH is a big one. The pH will break down the chemical over time if you if you have a pH below three, for example. Other material, other uh, considerations. Some of the chemicals will break down over time if they're dry. The silicates and acrylates will become friable like a peanut butter cookie. The water comes back up and it'll leak again. When I first went to the subway system of New York, they weren't excited. They said, we've already pumped uh, chemical grubs, and they leak. One year later, it's, 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 uh, the water comes back to the normal elevation, and, and they're leaking. I said, where did you pump? It was the acrylates. They had the wrong material. Um, migration's a question. A lot of people ask me, um, OK, you're going to seal my crack, but is it going to migrate on either way, on either side of the crack? And so I actually do one of my tests is a migration test. I have the equipment and the pumps. I've been doing it for 35 years. So I'll have a geologist, one of the guys that works with me, he'll inject the crack. If we have thousands of feet of crack to inject because it's migrating, then fine, bring in a contractor with five crews and they'll, they're geared up for something like that. It'll be cost effective. But sometimes the migration test actually seals the leak. That pass out, that, I, that, that handout that I just gave you with the before and after on that tunnel, there was a migration test. The client had ice on that ramp. They actually had handrails because people actually slipped and fell on that ramp going down and that uh, conveyor belt next to it could not be stopped. So it was a very dangerous situation. And this is a giant factor that had this situation for years. So we sealed it off. It was a six-foot leak and the client was very happy. It was the first time in 20 years he told me they were able to stop the water coming into that, that area. Um, what's the viscosity? Some grouts work when it's cold, or when it will not work when it's cold out. Um, soil conditions have to be looked at, uh, depending on the, the soil sometimes, uh, the chemical will not penetrate through the soil. Every now and then I, I would I'd literally do a field mock-up. The railroads would come to me and say, uh, we need you to, steal, to, to seal our railroad track. So I would build the railroad track. As a contractor, I wanted to do it first, then go in front of my client. So that's the, that was my approach. Uh, just some examples, injection concepts, the basics. Uh, they drill the injection hole, then you flush the hole with water to get it wet. The chemicals actually need water. An easy leak is a gusher for us. A difficult leak is a leak that doesn't have much water. So we'll actually pump the water <coughs> in first to get it wet to make sure the chemical reacts with it. Um, you set an injection port, uh, inject the crack. So here's a gentleman, he's got a drill, he's uh, drilling into the hole, to intersect the shear plane of the crack, usually about six inches deep. They have drill rigs that can do this when you're making a cut-off cut wall on the soil. 
These are the ports. These are installed in the drill hole, for example, um, and they each have their place. And uh, the, the bottom line is uh, the chemical can be ex injected through these up to about 3,000 psi. At 3,000 psi, the chemical will come out of the crack. It will hit you in the eye before you can blink. It will go through your skin in a reaction <coughs> moisture. So it will start going up your arm and start expanding. So it gets exciting if you don't have people that don't know what they're doing. Uh, these are sleeve pipes. Uh, these are used to inject soil. The pipe on the far right was used in the tunnel between, uh, I'm sorry, between France and England, the channel. They would make a pour. They would inject a perforated pipe, uh, 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 staple a perforated pipe onto the concrete, make the next pour, wait 30 days for the concrete to get some strength, and then they would inject into that perforated pipe. The reason they used them is that if they missed a spot, they could re-inject it. Uh, some of the equipment needle pipes are used, uh, they're very convenient sometimes. Um, the pumps, um, in this business, the moisture in this room would set off a pump. So the grounds are very reactive with water. So I can't tell you how many large general contractors would call me and say, well, Tom, we've got five pumps to sell you. What happened was they tried to get into the business not knowing what they're doing, the pumps set up. I've, I've pumped cements, I've pumped bentonites, I've pumped all the other materials, you can chip them out not the chemical rods, so like a hockey puck, or if the pump is done. <laughs> they now have pumps that are one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, these pumps are used with computers, which is nice. If you've got to be exactly at one-to-one, -one and you go off by you know 1% at 4 o'clock in the morning when the laborers are tired, etc., you can destroy the whole job. You can pump all that grout and it doesn't do what it's supposed to. So the computer on that pump will actually shut it off, which is a nice thing as an owner. Sometimes you want to fill up with a, uh, an area like this with cement, then piston pumps will do that. Radar is used quite often. Uh, so how big is the void on the other side of the wall? How big is the void under the floor? I don't know. So that's why I got this engineering company started, because the engineers and architects, number one, were specifying it not knowing the field at all. And so I had to work with them to get the specifications correct because I did the work. But the radar also helps to give them an idea of how much material is going to be used. Tom. Uh, these are different types of equipment and F-assembly. This is a one-to-one -one gun. When you have a one-to-one -one ratio, these work very nicely. Gauges are used. So equipment uh, considerations, you, everything is tiny. You have to go into manhole covers, for example, in a lot of places in the subways to get in. More considerations. So all these things go through my head when I'm looking at a job. That's my point. It's not a five-minute analysis. You have to see what's going on with that substrate. Use radar, pH, all these things. <coughs> You have to be careful with your equipment. All kinds of considerations with safety. The first guy I saw do chemical grouting went in a manhole for 15 minutes. This is before OSHA. Got out of the manhole, went to the hospital for six weeks. His lungs had turned to rubber. The urethane he inhaled reacted with the moisture in his lungs. So you have to have people with respirators, etc. These are the different ways to pump chemical grouts. That would take me three hours. But there are people that actually, there are a couple guys in the country that actually know all these different techniques to get the grout to the target zone, even when it's 20 feet in the ground, etc. Uh, these are a couple of examples of stabilizing a road with this particular grout. This is a before and after. The photo on the top is a water leak. There's a pipe coming into a manhole. The photo below, that foaming material is the chemical. The bottom line is it's like rubber. It'll allow that structure to move later without recracking. You can sand off the foam later. Another leak coming in from the sides of the joint on the left, and the foam coming out after that's sealed. Parking garage with a, leak, a sprinkler coming out of the floor, and on the right, that's the, the chemical uh, that's not unsealed. Absolute gusher on the left coming out, and they weren't even able to get here, and they sealed it off from above. Uh, the utility companies used this all the time. All kinds of pipes come into manholes that leak, and uh, they could be sealed with chemical grouts. Con Ed used to use this daily. Brick walls can now be sealed. As I mentioned, the accolades, you can now make a membrane with the <coughs> soil and the structure. Sometimes they're used to fill voids. Uh, we've had water wash out. Uh, manholes, uh, the edges of the manholes can now be lifted so that the manhole's not up in the air. You can lift the pavement to get it level in that void area. Again, that's the before and that's the after uh, with these materials. So. Uh, the second part about this is that uh, it's economies of scale. If you have a gigantic job, um, I'll go out there and I'll do a full engineering analysis. 
I'm not getting rich on the engineering analysis, but it has to be done. Otherwise, we're spending 50, 100 grand, whatever it is, and next thing you know, six months down the road, oh, it, it reacts with the creosote that Con Ed backfilled with. Gee, we didn't know it was there. That's why the other 23 guys are not in business. So I'm kind of a pain in the neck about making sure it's done right, but for good reason. On small jobs, the, the nuisance crack, that 10 foot crack, we all know where it is, it's making a mess. Con Ed, for example, would grab me. They had employees that would line them up. They'd see a puddle, they would slip on it quite on purpose, land on their back, and Con Ed has deep pockets. And they didn't do this, so they would use this to seal off those leaks. But what I would do is I would do a migration test and work with their budget. They might have a couple of grand in discretionary funds. It doesn't have to go to 17 layers of votes. They just want it done. The owner doesn't even want to know. Just, just fix it. And so a lot of hotel owners, hospital owners, they don't want to go through that process. Just come in for the migration test, work with us a little bit, and get this thing sealed. So I do that with a lot of owners. So it's affordable. It's affordable. It's much less than a contractor. When I was a contractor, four to five grand minimum to even show up. And it was the same amount of paperwork as a $100,000 job. So I didn't even want the one-day jobs. So that's why it's, it's cost-effective to work with an engineer. And because of scale, uh, I can work with you and take care of those headache nuisance costs that occur on occasion. So uh, are there any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to ask for Yeah, we'll hold off uh, just uh, uh, so if you're finished, you. Tom, and then we'll, we'll have a, a Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was most definitely, without a doubt, an all-star panel. Do you have any questions for our panel? Okay, we'll go to Mr. DeResta first. And and if you can, just to kind of identify yourself as a building owner or supplier or co-op condo board member. Building owner. The question has to do with the fact that tenants who smoke frequently remove their batteries or remove the smoke detector completely. So this is a question that I wanted to ask Jason. Where does the liability exist? Because you can't go into a person's apartment just on a to spot check. This is something that's affecting me right now. Jason first. The issue is you have uh, apartments with smoke detectors that are being uh, uh, disabled by the tenants. Well, I mean, if your building burns down, when you when you say where does the liability lie? What what liability? Well, is the insurance company going to say me? No. No, and not unless you have a condition in your policy that says that you know if smoke detectors are disabled, we will not pay for the insurance claim. But that's very rare. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think so. You know, you you're know. still going to get your building rebuilt. Um, you know, you could go after the tenant and try to sue him for negligence to recoup some of the, uh, the, the, the claim payment, but that's probably not going to be very effective. What are you looking at that? Your building's getting rebuilt. Yeah. Or they're getting all set in the sky. Yeah, if I might add to that, um, from a practical point of view, uh, hardwired smoke detectors, or better, the panels that I described, they can be designed so that if someone tries to disable them, central station will be notified and you'll know that the tenant has disabled. That's one way. The other way is to educate people to the fact that they're, they're endangering their lives and the lives of others. And it's a hard sell to do because some people just don't care. But you have to keep up the battle because there's a moral responsibility to try as owners and, and board members to do this. So those are two things I would suggest. Education and central station laws. Okay, we're going to go next to Mary Milano of Bronxville Gardens, correct? Hi, I'm co-op treasurer. Uh, this is a similar question. Um, we all have people in our buildings who do renovations and we all have rules about, you know, City of Yonkers licenses and Westchester licenses. Um, if that gets um, overlooked and somebody does not have the right contract or the right uh, license and causes a fire in their apartment, which in turn causes a fire for the whole building, is that on the board or the uh, managing agent who has not made sure that those requirements are met? 
And will it, another question like is, will the insurance company then say, no, you didn't follow up on your due diligence and we're not going to cover the building? Okay, so once again, you're not, your insurance company, if it's a standard and typical company that insures condos and co-ops around you, is not going to uh, decline to rebuild your building after a fire caused by a tenant's contractor. You're, you'll get your building rebuilt. The, the, the important thing um, is, number one, um, once your building is rebuilt, can your insurance company go back after the contractor that was liable for negligent in causing the fire? And the answer is only if that contractor has good insurance. So that gets to the the point of how, how do you control access to contractors coming on the property to do work inside of the, the units or the apartments and how do you review their insurance. And I, this is a very long and complicated uh, topic and I'm happy you can call me and we can discuss it further. But what I will tell you is buildings in New York City, nobody gets into a building in a nice, you know, well-run, man, well-managed building in New York City. Uh, to do renovation work without tons of paperwork and proof that they've got insurance, the right amount of insurance and everything else. But it's easier to do because there's one way of getting into a building, the front door. Here in Westchester, we've got multiple buildings, multiple doors. Sometimes we have no idea what, what you know, unit owners or shareholders are doing. So it's much tougher, but that's the dilemma. I mean, you know, your board needs to figure out, are we going to try to address this or are we just going to, you know, take chances, and I mean, you know, it's a, it's a business decision. Karen Gangora of River Edge, correct? Yes. Um, I have a question for the first speaker. Um, you said when you were talking about preparedness that um, we need to replace batteries regularly on our smoke detectors, but it was my understanding that the law passed that we need to have lithium batteries that are 10 years um, old, and correct. so, this kind of like contradicts that. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that that those that are left, there are still plenty of smoke detectors out there that require battery changes. But you're correct that the new longer, the newer upgraded uh, smoke detectors do have 10 year uh, lifespans in them. But then the 10 year lifespan will come at some point. <laughs> right, but my question is at yes. what point do we need to require that every unit has the 10 year lifespan? I think, that's, I think that's already on the books, but it's again, I'm, I'm, I'm it's a imagining that it's, it's, a not, it's not really happening, to a, it, it's happening to a certain extent, but I'm sure there are plenty of buildings, plenty of apartments in the county and residences that don't even have a smoke detector. We've all heard of fire departments responding to fires, found smoke detectors absent or not working, and loss of life has occurred. No reason for anybody to die anymore because there was not a working smoke detector. Personal responsibility, building responsibility, board responsibility, education, more education, checking, inspections. You know, it can be draconian because you don't want to do that, but. You're, that's so what I'm so speaking. The second part to the question is, in our, in our co-op, we furnished um, a smoke detector and a carbon monoxide detector to every unit in our building at our cost. Well, the building's cost, right? Uh, but then when they expired and the new law came into effect, um, is it okay that now we require each resident to replace with the new mandates? Absolutely. And I would also go so far as to say I wouldn't trust residents as much as I love all the residents and all the buildings. I wouldn't trust them to install anything. Unfortunately, you have to have staff do it. They have to sign an affidavit or a form or a list that says on such and such a date it was done. Because if something happens, you need all the legal backup that you possibly can, can have. Thank you. Any other questions? We have this gentleman. Longview Owners in Porchester, a new co-op member of our organization. Here you are, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple. Of, <coughs> excuse me. I have a couple of questions for Mr. Planner. Um, you know, we have uh, leakage in our elevator pit. Do you handle that? Yes. Um, also, um, on our terraces, we have the railings going into cement. And, and where, where the railings go into the uh, cement, there's rust around the area. 
and we're told that the rust extends to the I beams right. that um, the, the railings are uh, attached to. Could you do anything with that? Uh, yes, chemical grouts can be used to stop water from getting to steel. As a matter of fact, uh, on all the structures, parking decks, etc., anywhere you have a crack, the water's coming through that crack, and all of the corrosion that goes along the entire rebar is now concentrating right at that spot, so it's accelerating. So chemical grouts are used to slow down that process and minimize the amount of water uh, to get it to that, to that location. And there are also, um, there are also materials that can be used that will stop the corrosion rate from, let's say, 90% down to 3%. Uh, those materials actually came over from Russia when the wall came down. The Russians had this material, and they brought it over to the U.S. And the bridge engineers, with all the corrosion on the typical overpass bridge you see, said, you know, we don't believe you. And I didn't blame them on the same typical engineer. I don't believe you at all. Prove it. And they did. So there are materials now that can deal with corrosion very well. Thank you. If I might just add one thing is from a management perspective, um, I worked in a development for a development that had tremendous terrace issues with uh, railings. They literally had to rate, rip out the faces of all of the terraces and reinstall all of the railings. So the point is, don't let cracks start. Maintain terraces, waterproof them as necessary because the prevention is worth the pound of cure, you know, an ounce of prevention. So that, that's from a management perspective. You have to have a program. Don't, don't ignore terrorist issues in general because they come back to bite you later on in tremendous amounts of money. We had a co-op uh, the past few years. I think it was in White Plains, and they let the corrosion go on their, uh, uh, on their uh, iron wrought iron terraces, whatever, and they had to replace the whole thing. Just, just letting it go, letting it go. Again, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It's like, it's like you know, you let infrastructure go until, until it becomes uh, exorbitant to, to fix. We had, we got an estimate of a little over six million dollars to fix it. Yeah. All right, we have time for a couple of more uh, questions, uh, uh, Gene. Oh, uh, we, we uh, wait for the mic, Gene. Here's the mic. Um, no, use the mic because, in all fairness, yeah. Hello. Prefer a joke. Question. Does your system work to repair uh, cracked sewer pipe as an alternative to a liner? Um, that's, uh, the, um, you can use liners on the inside of the pipe. Um, and expansion joints in the pipe pipes are connected. Uh, there are uh, rigs that are developed where they have two bags, each one inflates on either side of the expansion joint, and the chemical grout is pumped into that joint and goes out into the soil and seals them. So chemical grouts can be used in those locations, but if you have a crack in the barrel section of the pipe, then a liner is a better option for that. <coughs> Florida has a huge problem with that. And uh, there's, there's literally I don't know, 20, 30 contractors, that's all they do is, is deal with uh, cracks in their sewer pipes. Well, we're coming up to uh, 8.10, so if there aren't any more pressing questions, uh, uh, please thank our panel again for their participation. I hope you got a lot of it. And, uh, the, two, uh, the two upcoming meetings, again, that if you can help us by appearing and showing your support, next Tuesday at the Greenberg Town Hall between 10 and 2, and then the meeting on June 6th here, uh, D-Day, uh, which we're trying to amass all of our uh, members in support for a meeting rally here at the Crown Plaza in support of the industry's very, very vulnerable position on the renewal of the rent laws. So um, thank you very much, and on behalf of Jeff Hanley and our uh, our speakers, uh, thanks for coming safe home and see you next week.